All right, well, let's uh, kick things off. Uh, welcome to the Lightning Talks. Uh, uh, I'm first speaker. I am here today to talk about DDD lessons, uh, domain modeling lessons that I wish I'd learned when I'd started, because over the last four years, I have made lots and lots of mistakes with the modeling side uh, and tried to solve it strategically with the pattern side. That doesn't work. So uh, just a little bit of background on myself. Uh, lead developer and solutions architect. I've been writing PHP web apps for about 12 years. I uh, used to be an architecture astronaut, uh, writing some of the most heavily architected code known to man. I have since recovered. There are help groups. Seek them if you need it. Um, I love DDD, and I love event sourcing. And if you get me talking about it, I will not stop. Eric will attest to this. And I also organize a meetup in Dublin around PHP. But let's move swiftly on, because this is a lightning talk. So lesson one, recognizing domain experts. So one of the problems we have at the beginning is that when we're looking for somebody that we consider a domain expert, we try to find somebody that's an expert on the solution. But what we really have here is somebody that has the existing solution in their head, but they're not a domain expert. They're a solution expert. They know what the current solution is, but they have no concept of the problems that led to those solutions. So if you're only talking to a solution expert, you'll probably end up implementing exactly what they already have, albeit with a fancier UI and with events. Whereas if you talk to the domain expert, you can figure this out and then work backwards to the real problems that led to those solutions in the first place. And by going back to the problem, you might end up building a better solution. So it's about trying to find more of these people. Now, these people can still help. It's just that you have to take what they say with a pinch of salt. And you need to drill down into it. And it's much easier if you find a, a full domain expert. Uh, lesson two, the UI is not a proxy for a domain expert. So when we started out, uh, we got lots of UIs explaining what the thing should look like. And what naturally happened from this is that we tried to reverse engineer from the UI domain events. And naturally what happened is CRUD language started bleeding in. So we had all these course created, course updated, course deleted events. And of course, these events had no semantic information. They were completely useless to consumers. They had to listen to multiple events to figure out anything of use. But the reason we did this is that we assumed that we were smart enough to reverse engineer. We don't need to talk to anybody. This is good enough. And yeah, we just ended up making very brittle models that uh, had to have their boundaries completely redefined. So yeah, don't do that. If you get a UI and they tell you to just implement it, it's not really DDD. Uh, lesson three, when interviewing domain experts, refine the constraints they define. So this is a two-stage process. Uh, when you're talking to a domain expert, your goal is to try to find the constraints of the system. So how does this system actually behave? What are the hard rules it has? And anytime they give you a constraint, you should drill down to figure out the sub-constraints of that system and just keep iterating and iterating and iterating until you have as many constraints as you could possibly imagine. Then you refine it. You don't build what they've just said because they've just given you not just everything that they believe should happen, but also their idealized scenario, ideal constraints. You know, what happens if you remove an item from the cart that doesn't exist? Oh, well, that should never happen. Keyword there is should. What happens if it does happen? And you just keep drilling down and you try to cut as many constraints as possible that aren't actually needed to make a stable system. Uh, because otherwise you will implement all of these constraints and they actually end up just making the, the system overly restrictive and not let people use it the way they want to. Uh, lesson four, this one I got very wrong at the start. Uh, subdomains and bounded contexts are very different things. Uh, at the beginning, I made the, un the leap that there's always a one-to-one -one mapping and they are very similar to each other. But realistically, they're completely different. Uh, domains and subdomains are composable. Uh, when I look at a domain, what I'm really looking at is a problem space. And each problem will break down. Now, this is an example here. Um, that previous company I worked with, uh, it was developing software for travel agents, travel agencies to do their job. And in order to run a successful travel agency, you need to be able to build trips for people, you need to be able to search, you need to be able to book things, and you need to understand finance how you're doing. Now, these break down then into sub-problems, and you basically can infinitely go down, and they're composable in a tree like this. It's a, it's a useful enough way to look at it, or at least explain the different systems to people. So bounded contexts do not align like that. They're not composable. And by that, I mean you're not going to have a bounded context within a bounded context. 
what you're actually going to have is a series of independent units that are communicating via some mechanism. That could be events, that could be HTTP calls, doesn't really matter. All that matters is, is that they're loosely coupled and they are completely self-contained and they're just pat talking to each other. So this leads on to this one, which is domains and context do not always align. So I made the mistake, naivest mistake at the beginning that thinking that if I map out the domains as circles and have them all drawn, it looks pretty, I could map the context on top of it, problem solved. Well, no, this is a real, this, that's not what happens. That's not what we experienced at all. So to give an example here, we have two domains. We have payroll and HR, and then we have accounting and reporting. So these are two different problem spaces that people want solved. Now, we were able to implement this as by wrapping just one bound of context because we found the rate of change was similar between these two and they were constantly communicating using the same language. Same with accounting and reporting, so we just wrapped them together. But then we had a problem of payroll need to communicate with accounting because, they, you know, somebody, uh, somebody has just joined the company. They need to get paid. They need to tell the accounts, give us money. You get to deduct money and give it to them. You're not going to have very happy employees if they're not getting paid in time. So you needed to communicate between the payroll and the accounting but they're two different bounded contexts. So where does this translation logic lie? This, the communication between a payroll and accounting. Do you introduce accounting language into the payroll system or do you introduce payroll language into the accounting system? Uh, the answer is neither. What you actually do is you create a bounded context which is its own self-contained language of translating from a subset of the payroll language to a subset of the accounting language. It's like, uh, it's like having a person who's able to communicate between the two systems and manage that process. It's actually its own bounded context that is connecting these two systems and it is technically not mapping onto any of the well-defined domains. Okay, so it's a lightning talk and there are many more lessons I'd like to get into, so I'm going to fly through these. Okay, one, temporal constraints are far more costly to implement than value constraints. Uh, you've got two types of constraints in systems, really like a value is, is this data in and of itself valid? Then you've got a temporal constraint, which is, is this data in and of itself valid given some previous historical fact? In modeling a system, temporal constraints tend to be a lot more expensive to implement and maintain than value constraints. Therefore, when you're doing the culling process with the domain expert, try to get rid of as many naive temporal constraints as you can. Like, you know, the classic example is, what happens if somebody pays for something before they're billed for it? Oh, that should never happen. Keyword there is should. It can actually temp technically happen. That's a naive temporal constraint. So try to get rid of that. Makes your system just more useful. Uh, const constant refactoring is key to understanding a domain. So if you really want to become a domain expert, talk to them, build something, and then go back to them, re refactor it to gain new insight, and then go back to the domain experts and say to them, okay, well, we discovered this thing, what should that be called? It's a constant iterative process with you, uh, with a feedback loop between you and the domain experts. So a lot of people think you talk once, you're done. No, it's just a constant process. Um, hold event storming sessions, even if you're not event sourcing. So we find this particularly useful. Even if you're not building an event sourced application, an event storming process will allow you to treat your system as a temporal system, as opposed to a series of state changes. We found that this is much more useful to to communicate about the problem, the domain space, and how things actually flow. And even if you then implement that as a standard CRUD app, whatever way you do it, it'll make a lot more sense and it'll actually be a lot closer to what's really going on. But if you can't event source it, do it. Uh, number nine, applying DDD works and it makes you a better developer. A lot of times when you get into DDD, you feel overwhelmed with all the, the wealth of information and knowledge and expertise. And you feel like, where do I start? Oh God, I'll never be any good, et cetera, et cetera. The thing is, is that applying DDD, it works and it will make you a better developer and it's just a constant iterative process. And the key thing I would say is that learning about DDD and the techniques doesn't change anything about you fundamentally. You've just learned that there's so much knowledge and expertise you don't have, you can get better. Even if you weren't aware of DDD, you actually still had those problems except they were hidden. And finally, if it's not your core domain, don't build it yourself, use an existing solution. For instance, if your business is not in the business of identity and access management, there is no point in building an event source identity and access management system because it's just a waste of time. Having the best IAM system is not going to improve your core business. If your core business is a travel agency, having an event sourced IAM is just going to get in the way and slow you down. And bonus 11th that I uh, created on the way to this talk is roles are not contexts. 
So one of the systems we built was job seeking. We had three contexts initially, job seeker, seeker, recruiter, and administrator. They were three contexts constantly communicating with events. There were actually four bounded contexts where it was a collaborative domain where those three roles were interacting together. So we made the mistake of assuming that if you are in the role of job seeking, oh, that must be a context. No, nope, that was a big problem. Okay, well, that was the lightning top talk. I hope you enjoyed and thanks for listening.